part four, the final installment of this series called Got Questions. Got Questions, where we're looking at the questions, some questions, big questions that Jesus asked. And I've been challenged by this series in a lot of ways. One way in particular, and just the premise of this teaching is, is the teaching style of Jesus, that he, he didn't give a lot of answers. He really didn't. He didn't answer people's questions. He would often answer their questions with another question. And so I've been challenged by, by this thought, the style, a uh, teaching style of, of Jesus that, that honestly, as leaders, as, as people, as Christians, as we, we should be giving a lot less answers and seeking to understand a lot more. We should, be, we should be given a lot more questions to help people lead themselves to discovery and revelation. And this is what Jesus does so well. All throughout the scriptures, we see him just posing some questions that, are, that cause us to think, that cause us to maybe open up a, a, areas that we weren't thinking about before, and it's leading to revelation. And I hope that's what this series has done for you over the last several weeks. And today, as we kind of conclude this series, I hope that's what this last installment will do for you as you think about and ponder the question of Jesus and what he's really trying to get to the bottom of. Let's jump into John chapter 21 for the last installment. I'll show you what that question is. He repeats this question very often. It's actually three times he repeats this question to Peter. Let me kind of uh, contextualize, give context to this story. This is the third appearance of Jesus to his disciples. The third time that Peter and the rest of the disciples actually have seen Jesus after resurrection. This is post-resurrected Jesus now. Now, the, but in this instance, that Jesus that we're going to read, it's important for you to know that Peter and some of the other disciples ha have gone back to their livelihood of fishing. That 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 they're that Peter, what Jesus called Peter out of, he said. Peter, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Because it ended so abruptly and so with a lot of questions in the air about who this Messiah is and what kind of kingdom he was supposed to bring, and I don't fully understand that. And honestly, on the backdrop of all the failure and shame that Peter was feeling because of his own experience that we're going to look into today, he retreats back to his former lifestyle of what God called him out of. And he starts fishing again, and Jesus shows up on the seashore and says, hey, and he does that miracle catch again with them, calls them out, makes breakfast for them there on the, on the shore, and, and then begins to ask a question to lead Peter, and I hope lead us into a deeper revelation and a deeper understanding of who Christ is and what he, what he even is looking from us, asking of us. So when they had finished eating that breakfast Jesus cooked, he cooked the fish right there on the, on the beach, he said to Simon Peter, he said, Simon, son of John, I think it's really um, important that you know that he called him Simon. He had already, called, like, he'd already changed his name to Peter, and he knows that, like, that's Peter, but Jesus called him Simon. He called him what he used to be. Simon, son of John, do you love me? more than these. And this is the, these are the disciples that are, that are there. Okay, the, the, Do you love me more than these? And we're going to get back to that in just a moment. Yes, Lord, he said. You know I that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And this is the question that we are going to look at today that Jesus asks. Do you love me? And we already know, you guys, that Jesus knows the answer to this question, okay? Jesus knows all. He knows that in Peter's heart, he knows the answer to this. So obviously the question wasn't for Jesus, Jesus doesn't ask questions for his own self-understanding. He's asking a question so that, deep, that Peter could be led to a deeper understanding himself. So let's, let's understand that. He's not going, hey, Peter, come on now. Do you? Do you now? You messed up enough. Do you really love me? No. He knows what's in Peter's heart. He knows Peter's intentions and his motives. He's trying to get Peter to understand something. These questions that he's asking him is going to reveal something inside of us. And this question has an even deeper meaning 
on a, considering the, the backdrop of, of what just happened in Peter's life. That Peter is coming off of um, a great failure, a great letdown, a great, a, an experience where he denied Jesus three times. In fact, it says in Matthew chapter 26, 33, it's in your notes up here, check it out. It says this, when Jesus was actually predicting Peter's denial, Jesus told them this very night, you will fall, all fall away of me, on, on, all fall away on account of me. For it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But he says, after I have risen, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter replied, even if all these other chumps leave you, Jesus, I'm never, I never will. So check out, so Jesus, which brings context to Jesus' question. Jesus' first question was like, so Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you really? Because they all ran. So did you. Oh, but no, I mean, Peter's, Peter's this prideful, boisterous, uh, vocal, oh, I, not even if all these fall away, I'm, I, I never will. And Jesus tells him, well, truly I tell you, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared again, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. So, so now this, this, I love Jesus. Man, as I was reading this all throughout this week, I was brought to tears because this story just makes me love. It makes me fall in love with Jesus all over again because here is Peter who is full of shame and regret. He's, he's made a huge mistake and he's, and he's so consumed with it that he goes back to a previous lifestyle and thinks, you know what, I can't do what Jesus, I know he said I'm going to be this forerunner. I know he said that on this rock I'm going to build my church. And I know he's called me out to be a fisher of men, but, but I messed it up, and I messed it up big time. And so I'm going to have to go. So this message is for anyone today who feels like that, that you've messed up who feels like you've, you've been disqualified or feels like that, there is, that you are less than because of the mistakes that you made. And Jesus wants to pause in the middle of everything and go, do you love me? And listen, it's not, about, it's not, it's not a question of, hey, if you love me, you wouldn't make the mistake. No, because Jesus is trying to get to the bottom of something with Peter. Jesus didn't call Peter based upon who he was or how good he was or what he was doing or not doing. He called Peter based upon how good Jesus himself was. Yeah. And so this relationship and how we relate to God and our following of God and our affection, our love for God has nothing to do with how good or bad you are. And so he asks you this question, do you love me? And do you equate in your mind at this question the list, do you start running it down? Do you start thinking about the things that you've done or haven't done? Do you love me though, Peter? Do you love me? Do you think, well, I do, but, but, and this, so this message for anyone who thinks, am I even really saved? Am I saved? I don't know if you ever wonder that. Do I love God? Could I, could I even do anything great for God because of, I love Peter's story because Peter's story is real. Peter's story is personal. Peter's, hey guys, Peter is me. Peter is you. Peter is us. That's what makes his story so personal. When you read, when you read the story, like Peter and Peter's life, man, I mean, Peter's story is full of calling and risk and mouth <laughs> and, and, and danger and rich and fumbles and denial and privilege and restoration. This is our story. It's a story of grace and love and renewal. Yeah. I, I love Jesus for this, that he takes a moment and has this, this real moment with Peter, who is hurting, who is full of shame, and wants to make sure that as he moves forward into his kingdom and what he's called him to do, that he wants to move forward on the right foundation. Amen. On the right, with the right, that, that, that you are, Peter, you are who I said you are. And I'll even call you Simon. I know your mistakes. I know your past. I know your issues. And I called you anyway. Yeah. Go feed my sheep. Yeah. Go take care of my lambs. Simon, I know you. I know you, Simon. I called you. I called you out of that. Simon, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And, and he says it three times. He goes over this three times. 
And some, some like I was reading different commentaries and, 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 and all that stuff and, and books about this, this restoration of Peter. And, and some people say, you know what, the three, the three occasions that Jesus is, is, is posing this question, it kind of counteracts and cancels the three denials that Jesus here in, in three times making Peter confess his faith and confess his love is destroying, is eradicating, is canceling the denial so that Peter could move forward. And I love that. There's also another thought that, that I believe that it's kind of both of these, that in this time of culture and history, that contracts were made based upon um, three, three-fold questions and answers would equal a contract. Oh, I love that. Don't you love that? That, that Peter, that, that Jesus is, is now reminding Peter that, that we have this covenant, that I'm going to make a covenant again with you and remind you of the covenant that I have called you and I have set you apart. Do you, do you love me? I love, I love this because if Peter would, would have not had this pause, this moment with, with Jesus, I wonder what Peter's life would have looked like, Right? I wonder who Peter would have been and what he would have done or tried to accomplish without this foundation of, of love. Now, this word that Jesus used, love, let me do a little bit of uh, Greek study with you guys, okay? Because we get the one word, love, and Peter responds, yeah, you know that I love you. But when you look at this, this, the Greek of the language and what they're actually saying, although in your Bibles it says love, 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 there's actually a different word that they're using when they're actually communicating there between each other, it brings up a little bit more understanding. So for the Greek words of love, there's there, one word is, is eros, which is that sensual kind of love. It's a physical love. Another Greek word for love is phileo, which is the fond, I'm fond of you kind of love. It's an affection. It's affection, brotherly affection or, or, or fondness. I'm fond of you. And then there is the agape, which a lot of you have, have maybe heard. That is the the unconditional, high, it's the highest level. It's, it's supremely. I love you supremely. I, I love unconditionally. That's the word that is used here by Jesus. So let me, let me break it down to you just, just so you can see. The first question Jesus asked looks like this. Jesus is asking, Peter, Simon, do you love me supremely? Do you love me agapas? And then Peter responds, I phileo you. You know I'm fond of you. And I think this, uh, this now, as you see this now in this story, underscores Peter's shame and his guilt and why Jesus is even asking this question. Because Peter, because of his mistakes, thinks he can't love God supremely. Of course, I, you know I, I'm fond of you, but I can't love you supremely because look what I did. I can't love you on, without condition because look who I am. Look what I went back to. You know that I'm, I'm fond of you, Jesus. And then Jesus asked a second time, do you love me, Agapis? Do you love me supremely, Peter? And again, Peter responds, well, Jesus, you know I'm fond of you. And then it's the third time that Jesus changes his question. He says, are you really fond of me, Peter? Do you really phileo me? And, and Peter at that is hurt. He's hurt that Jesus asks him a third time. He's hurt that Jesus lowers, comes down to his level of love instead of him rising to the level of supreme, unconditional love for his Savior. That, that the main idea, the reason why Jesus, I believe, is asking this question is because the main, the main purpose of following Jesus, the main purpose of our mission and our life and our Christianity and our faith, listen, is love. It's love. It's love. That is the purpose. That is, that is, inten that is the, the fuel and the foundation of our faith. And anything else is worthless. Any other form of your Christianity, any other form of following Jesus, anything that Peter would do beyond this, could have done beyond this, without this moment of pause and reflection and restoration of Jesus to a supreme, unconditional love would have been a worthless effort, futile by Peter. That's why he pauses and says, do you love me supremely? Because love has to be the fuel and the foundation of our faith 
in our lives. Let me give you a few scriptures to prove this. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. Paul says it like this. Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you. How many of you want that? The life of Christ just released, coming from inside of you. And the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. You see, any other, any other source is wrong. Any other root, if, it does, if it's not rooted and tethered to this agape, supremely, unconditional love for Jesus, it's worthless. It's meaningless. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us. I think this is, this is part of the question here that Jesus is asking. What is fueling you? What is motivating your faith right now? What is motivating your life? What, 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 what's, what are you passionate about? The Bible says that it is Christ's love that is the fuel of my life. It's the passion of my life. It's what motivates me to get up. It's what motivates me to serve. It's what motivates me to give. It's the motivation of my life purpose is my love, my supreme love for Jesus, because we are absolutely convinced that he has given his life for all of us. And this means, he says, that all died with him so that those who live should no longer live self-absorbed lives. Amen. And this is, this, is, this is what that supreme love does for us. Anything less than that is self-absorbed. Anything less than that puts you at the focal place. Self-absorbed lives, but lives that are poured out for him. The one who died for us and now lives again. See, the, 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 the pause for Peter as he's full of shame and guilt, this restoration that God is, that Jesus is, is doing for Peter to get him back to this place that, look, you, you don't have to have it all together. You, know, you, can, you can love me this way supremely, and you actually, you need to. Oh, it's not going to work, because without love, it all fails. It's, there's actually a whole chapter on love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that talks about that without love, what our life would be. And, it's, and I'd love to, let me just do a little study with you on, on what the Bible says, our life, without agape, and that's what the word is used all throughout 1 Corinthians 13, without this supreme love, in our life, without loving God supremely, what happens? You write some notes, you guys. Number one, without love, without this supreme love, all I say is ineffective. I mean, the, what the Bible says here is that if you're a communicator, and the world is impressed with charismatic communicators, people that are great orators, it is a, it, the, what the Bible is saying here is words aren't the key, your heart is. It doesn't matter what's coming out of your mouth. It doesn't matter is, is, is what is in your heart. And really what we say is not so much as important as what, what, what's behind the words that we're saying. What is motivating the words that we're saying? Which is why the Bible says this. says, speak the truth. Speak like If I speak in tongues of men or of angels but don't have love, I'm an, only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I could speak truth, but if it doesn't come from a motivation of love, it's meaningless. Which is why the Bible says in Ephesians that, yeah, be a truth teller. Speak the truth. Be a truth teller, but don't stop there. Well, I just tell it how it is. Well, I just, well, I just tell the truth. That's the way. No, no, no. No, that's not what the Bible says to do. Yeah, speak the truth. Be a truth teller. But speak the truth in love. Which is one of the reasons why I despise doctrinal debates. I despise doctrinal dis debates because it goes against this right here. That we think the goal is to be right. The goal is not correctness. The goal is love. Amen. That's why Peter, that, that's why Jesus is posing this question. Is, is Peter's missed the goal. He thought, he thought it was about him measuring up to a certain standard of goodness. And that that would equate to what he could do and what God can do in his life, even how much affection and love that he had for God. And, and Jesus is shattering that. All I say is ineffective. Without love, number two, without love, all I know is insignificant. It's insignificant. I think there is an inordinate amount of, of passion in our society and culture for more knowledge. 
Wouldn't you agree that we live in a knowledge-saturated, like information-saturated, information and knowledge is more readily available now than ever before in history. And I think what we do, we measure Christianity, check it out, based on how much we know. So, so what, is, what does it mean to be a disciple? What does a healthy disciple look like? What does a healthy disciple look like? When we think about that, we think about everything we know. Oh, a disciple knows. They know the Bible and they know stuff. You're missing the point. You're, you're missing the point entirely. And I love, now look, I love doctrine. I love doctrine. A part of step one, we have every first Sunday of the month, which is next Sunday, we teach doctrine. Here is the, here's, we have a truth basis based upon the word here at Discovery, okay? So, so I love doctrine, I do. But the Bible sa- says that that's not the goal. The goal isn't to get smarter. The goal isn't to study the Bible more. That's not the important thing. And I'm an advocate for studying. Don't get me wrong. The Bible says study to show yourself approved, right? A good workman who handles the word of God, um, handles the word of God, you know, of truth, that can correctly handle the word of truth. I get it. But that's what, but if you do that without, without doing the first thing first, it's meaningless. It's worthless. It's, it, it is all worthless, you guys. It's not the point. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2 says, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all what? Oh, if I grew in knowledge, if I knew all the doctrines and all the theology, but I didn't have love, I am nothing. You can be a Bible scholar and miss it. You can, you can check it out. You can be full of biblical knowledge and still be nothing. Amen. Ouch, right? Uh, this is, that's, no, that's not me. That's Bible. That's, that's what the Word of God is saying. That without this, I miss the point. And I think this is what Jesus' message was to the religious people of his day. And I think we need to be careful that one of the things I despise about the, about the a form or a model of Christianity as we know it is that we get to a place where we love our doctrine or our version of truth more than love, loving God and loving people, that we love our particular brand of church, our brand of church, our brand of worship, our brand of of preaching, and above the biggest idea of scripture, which is love. So check it out. So we're correct, but we're stale. And something's wrong with that. We We got a bunch of knowledge, but we're stale. We're nothing. The Bible. Something is wrong with that, you guys. There is so much knowledge available to us. We're knowledge junkies. You Google and information and more, 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 and I think it's good. Information is good and knowledge is good, but I think we value it too much. We value answers too much. The answers, the answers. Give me the answers, but we have more knowledge in our world now than we ever had before and ever. Look where it's gotten us. Is it better? Is more knowledge equal better? No, I think we, we miss it. Because without love, all I know is insignificant. Which is why when people ask, what is it, what is it a disciple of Jesus look like? What, what, oh man, I want, is there something I discovered for discipleship? Yes, absolutely. It's called loving God, loving each other, and changing the world. That's what it is. That's what a disciple looks like. It's not what you think it is. It's not what you think it is. It's not getting more information and knowledge crammed and doctrine crammed in your head. That's part of it. But it happens in the context of loving God passionately, loving others authentically, and changing the world. That's that's what true discipleship looks like. True discipleship does not look like cramming more doctrine and information in your brain. That is not discipleship. That's not. Is it a part of it? Yes. Within the context of love. Love. That's what... That's, that is what's supreme. If I, without love, all I know is insignificant, which is why the Bible says this, that knowledge actually puffs us up. It, but knowledge just puffs us up, gets our head bigger. We think we know stuff. We can correct people more. We feel like we can stand a little bit taller. We feel like we're something. Knowledge puffs up, but love is what's going to build you up. Love is what's going to allow you to build others up. You think that gaining more knowledge that makes you more readily available. Now I can teach. Now I can be a leader. Now I can be somebody in the body of Christ. No, you can't. Not without love. 
just because, no, you missed it. And I think so much in our culture, in our Christianity, in our faith, we've missed it. We've missed it. Do Jesus is pausing us right now, church, and I hope you hear the question. Do you love me supremely? Because without love, all I know is insignificant. Write this one down. Without love, all I believe is insufficient. All I believe is insufficient. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says it like this. If I have faith, that can move mountains. Wow, that's powerful faith. Isn't that faith? Wow. If I have faith, that actually works. Faith that actually can, can things are happening and moving, and I can pray good, and I sound good too. And people are like, I sound good when I pray. I sound holy when I pray and stuff. Man, my prayer, and, and even, but not only that, he, there's an effect of my prayers. He says, if I have a faith that causes effect in my life and in people's life, I move mountains. But if I do not have love, I'm nothing. That if without love, all I believe is not enough. See, I think that a lot of people are erroneously believe that the secret of Christianity is your belief system. And I got bad news for you if that's what you think it is, that the secret of your Christianity is your belief system. And that is the devil believes in God too. Be- believing in God, belief is not enough. The Bible says, check it out, there is a tangible measurable way that we can see our faith expressed, showed, and proved. And that is having love for God and love for people. That is a tangible expression. So you cannot say that you believe and that you love God, but there is no no passion for him. It's not a fuel. It's not a motivation. There is no love for how you treat people. How do you treat people? How do you treat people? That's, that's the litmus test of your belief is your love quotient. It's tangible. Galatians chapter 5, 6 actually says it like this, that the only thing that counts, Peter, is not how smart you are, good you are. It's, it, no, 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 no. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself, not in mountains moving, not in healings happening faith expressing itself in love. That's the only thing. It's not an amazing statement. The only thing that counts. Nothing else counts. I don't know what you're measuring. I don't know know what's our measuring stick of Christianity or what you think it means to be a good Christian. Peter definitely had it wrong. He thought he was full of shame and guilt because of his failure and his mistakes. He checked, oh, there it is. I don't know what you're measuring, like what is the measure of your faith, but the Bible says the only thing that counts is how you love. See, God is so much more concerned, not about how good you are or bad you are, but how you love. Can you hear that? Okay, it's in, that, 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 is, that is the absolute truth. God is not concerned about how good or bad you are. He's concerned about your love. That's where it starts. Because if it can start there and change there, everything else is affected. All I believe is insufficient, which means that the only thing that counts is not the fact that you wear a label. It's not, it's not the fact that you go to church. It's not the, the fact that you're a believer, but that it has a tangible, measurable expression in our world that shows up in love. Amen. Are you seeing this with me, church? Are you getting anything out of this, you guys? Yeah. Okay, here it is. Without love, without love, all I give is incomplete. All I give is incomplete. It doesn't matter what I... It, it, look, he says like this in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I give all I possess to the poor, if I give it all away, but I do not have love, there is no benefit coming back to me from that. There is no blessing coming back to me from all that I have given. If I give to the poor and I go serve the inner city and I go make it... Whatever it is that you're... If I go and make a difference, but if it's not in love, there is nothing thing coming back to you. You gain nothing if it's not from this motivation of love. Isn't that huge? That God still doesn't use that. He doesn't use that as a measuring stick. How much you give, how much you serve. No, that's not the measuring stick. The measuring stick is love, supreme, unconditional love. Here's, Here's another one. All I, without love, all I accomplish is inadequate. 
After you write that word in your notes, look up here just for a moment. Because this happens from time to time when I'm studying, and I just feel like, like this is a moment that God showed me that some of you need to hear this, okay? Because some of you have been, have been doing this Christian thing for maybe a while. You've been pursuing holiness. You've been pursuing perfection. You've been pursuing knowledge. You've been pursuing uh, knowing more, and you're coming up empty. And you're on what I call a roller coaster because sometimes you're holy and sometimes you're not. And sometimes you're, you're knowing and sometimes you're not. And sometimes you're good and sometimes you're not. And you try and you try. And you even have maybe pursued things in life like, like to try to find accomplishment and meaning like money or success or career. And all those things, they're wonderful things. I, don't get me wrong. They can be used for good. But you've come up empty. And you feel that time and time again empty and you know in your spirit deep down inside that there's a void something in your heart that is missing something's missing the bible makes it very clear when it says in first corinthians chapter 13 verse 3 if i give over my body to hardships that i may boast i don't have love i gain nothing so for for whatever reason through a, a series of circumstances of events of people of, of missteps and mistakes that you have made, our hearts are messed up. And you've gone back fishing. And, 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 and here's, here's the danger of this is because when we make mistakes and we, we, we make missteps, I think it's a, it's, a lot, it's a lot easier to pursue knowledge and holiness or perfection or career or advancement. It's, 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 it's easy to pursue those things and fill up my brain than pursuing intimacy with God because the closer I get to God, the more I feel my shame and my regret. And I don't want to get too close, but I do still want to be a Christian and have faith. So I'm going to lean into pursuing this stuff and things and knowledge instead of pursuing you, Jesus. Right, right. Which is a crazy catch-22 because... because that shame and that guilt or whatever it is, whatever those missteps or mishaps that affected our heart and leave us empty today, empty, not feeling the supreme empowered fuel of your faith of love. And we feel shame and guilt. It's actually only by coming into intimacy with Jesus that that shame is eradicated. Amen. And so we're pursuing these other things, these other forms of godliness that are getting no result. And eventually we become empty. Listen, all without love, all that you accomplish is inadequate. It's nothing. Amen. So we, we, we have to learn how to get off this roller coaster of what I'm calling self-effort. This roller coaster of up and down. Peter was hot and cold. He was loud and then quiet. It was all dependent upon his own efforts. We have to learn how to get off this roller coaster of self dependent life and learn how to love God supremely. That it's not about what you've done or what you're going to do, it's about who He is and what He's invited you into. So how do we do this? How do we get off this roller coaster, you guys? How do we how do we how do we stop coming up empty like this? And how do we make the main thing back to the main thing instead of all the other things that we may have made it? Take some notes with me, you guys, because 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says it like this. He says, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. If you, if you think that, oh, I'm good, I know. If, if you think that, that like Peter did, oh, if, all, if they fall away, even if they fall away, I ain't going to fall away, God, you be careful. You be careful if you think you're good in your faith and how much you know and how long you've been serving God and how much Bible that you know and all the things that you think you do that qualify you. If you think you're standing firm, you be careful because you're heading for a fall. Right, right. So I don't care where you're at in your faith. I don't care how long you've been serving God or how much you know about the Bible. Man, I hope that you take some notes and that you hear the pause and the question of Jesus today. Do you love me supremely, hey, I've called you to do some things and I've equipped you to do some things and I'm gonna, you're still gonna do those things and you'll go feed my sheep, go take care of my people, go do what I've called you to do. But before you do that, stop. Do you love me supremely? Because all that doesn't mean anything if you can't answer this question. So here it is. Here, write some notes. Number one, we have to focus on walking with Jesus. Focus 
on walking with Jesus. Not, not, not producing results, not on working for Jesus. Just focus on what the Bible calls abiding, remaining in Jesus. John chapter 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do what? Well, doesn't that sound familiar? You can't, Jesus says, look, all you have to do is remain in me and, and you'll get the production of your life of fruitfulness. Now, fruitfulness is not just like success and all that. People think, oh, I'm fruitful. Those are things. I'm going to success and I'm living large. I'm, I'm living my best life. No, that's not, that's not the fruitfulness. The fruitfulness he's talking about here is people. Amen. Is, is your life, your, the result of your life will be people will be affected. People, you, you'll lead people to Jesus. You'll affect people for Jesus. They'll look at your life and they'll say, wow, look at something about them. They make me want to thank God in heaven because of the way that they're living life. Focus on walking with Jesus, not working for Jesus, not doing things for Jesus, not running ahead. And No, no, no. Slow down. Hey, hey, hey. Do you love me? Focus on abiding, remaining. That's what one of the translations says, to remain in me, to abide in Jesus. Here's number two. I got to hurry, you guys. I'm running out of time already. Number two is learn to extend and receive grace. Learn to extend and receive grace. This is one of Peter's faux pas here because people that actually, you know, live life, their life based on self-effort or they have some form of arrogance or pride or what I can do, it's, it's, they, hold, they, they actually hold other people to that same standard of self-effort. They judge really easily and they're critical of others, but I found that you cannot really give this grace unless, unless you've received this grace. So honestly, there's almost, it's actually kind of a good thing that, that, that Peter had to fall because Peter's heart was wrong. Because Peter's heart, was, so thank God that he actually had this falling experience so that he can learn from it. And maybe you've had an experience where you've kind of, your, your, your behavior, your habits, your, your belief system, whatever it is, had led you to a, a fall. Honestly, that could be a good thing, depending on how you answer this question. Do you love me? Right. Hey, do you, do you love me? So you gotta, yeah, in order to extend this grace and this love that you actually have to have received this grace and this love from God. So you want to you wanna love more? You want to love people more? Focus on the love that God has given you. You want to forgive others and be able to release people? Hey, consider how much you have been forgiven yourself. Learn to receive and extend grace. First John chapter 4, verse 19 says this, that we love because we actually received it first. We can give this unconditional Agape, supreme love, and live the, because I have received this unconditional supreme love. The only way I'm going to be able to extend that grace is if I've received that grace. Here's number three. Number three is stop trying to measure up and just keep getting up. Amen. Stop trying to measure up and just keep getting up. You see, after Peter's denial, something changed inside of Peter's life. I think something like died inside of him. It was like a conversion moment for him where Peter's own bold confidence and strength was killed. And the fundamental question we have to ask ourselves is, what does God think about me when I fail? What does God think about me when I fail? For most of us, we think it's nat natural to assume that on the other side of failure lies judgment, shame, abandonment, after that, I mean, we, we just see, because that's what we see around us, right? That's what we see around us. So that's what we expect. But God responds to our failures with grace, yeah. with love, yeah. with forgiveness. Yeah. Proverbs 24, 16 says it like this, that for the lovers of God may suffer adversity and stumble seven times. You're going to fall. You're going to stumble. But they will continue to rise over and over again. Jesus blots out, eradicates all of his failures, all of his shame with one question. Do you love me? Here's, here's the last thing. If you want to get off the roller coaster, you guys, of, of self-effort, this last one. Make love your greatest aim. Make love your greatest aim. See, right, right after Paul 
you know, writes 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in this love chapter. Without love, without love, it's nothing, it's meaningless. The first verse of chapter 14 summarizes the whole, the whole chapter 13. Let love be what? Your greatest aim. Let love be your real target. Make love the thing that you're trying to accomplish most in your life. What have you made your aim? What have you made your goal? I think, again, even in our Christian faith, when we, if I were to ask you, what does it mean to be a Christian? A committed Christian, what does that look like? Having not heard what I talked about, you would probably say, oh, there's someone who attends church a lot. It's someone who, who, who is always at church. It's someone who knows a lot of their, their Bible. I mean, they know the Scriptures so much, but if you search the Scriptures and find out what that answer is, it has nothing to do with that at all. You, you'll discover that, that being a Christian is not about what you know. It's about how much you love. Amen. Make love your greatest aim. What you're going to discover about God is that he's a lot less concerned about how good or bad you are. Yeah, he's concerned about your heart. He's concerned about how you love, how you treat people, and how you love him. Amen. You know why he's so concerned with love? why we should make it our greatest aim, why without it, your life is meaningless, everything I do is futile, it just is not eternal. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. The one who doesn't love has yet to know God. The one who doesn't agape, that's the word. The one who doesn't love without condition, love supremely, doesn't know God because God is, the, God is love without condition. God is supreme love love. So here's the question again. Do you love me? Supremely love me. Some of you have ran from this question and you've made faith about other things because of your shame, because of your regrets, because of your past. And I think God wants us to pause and he's saying all of it is meaningless without answering this right. Do you love me supremely? Come on, let's bow our heads all across this world.